This is the World Organic News for the week ending 30th of October 2017. John Moore reporting. I'll begin this week with a big shout out to Andy from Bath in the UK for his kind words about the podcast. I really appreciate the feedback. Thank you. And if you too, like Andy, would like a copy of the One Square Metre Garden handout, it is still available. Email me at square at worldorganicnews.com and it'll be in your inbox pronto. There's a link in the show notes. Our first post this week is from the blog Ancient Foods and is entitled New Genomic Insights Reveal a Surprising Two-Way Journey for Apple on the Silk Road. Quote, Centuries ago, the ancient networks of the Silk Road facilitated a political and economic openness between the nations of Eurasia. But this network also opened pathways for genetic exchange that shaped one of the world's most popular fruits, the apple. End quote. This is hardly surprising. As humans moved along the Silk Road, or more correctly Silk Roads, the human genome travelled also. So too, one of our favourite fruits travelled with us. The old thinking was the apple was discovered in Kazakhstan and mutated as it travelled from this centre of origin. This was one of the main impulses for Nikolai Vavilov in his collection of seeds and cuttings for the Leningrad Seed Bank discussed way back in episode 2 on the 8th of February 2016. His idea was to head to the centres of origin for our food species and collect the originating material, the thinking being we could return to first principles when breeding new varieties. What Ancient Foods Post tells us is that the genes, in this case of apples, were flowing out of and back through the point of origin. This new genetic study shows us, longish quote, the most exciting outcome of this genomic comparison is a comprehensive map of the apple's evolutionary history. Previous studies have shown that the common apple, Malus domestica, arose from the Central Asian wild apple, Malus serviesi, with contributions from crab apples along the Silk Road as it was brought west to Europe. With the results of this new study, the researchers could zoom in on the map for better resolution. We narrowed down the origin of the domesticated apple from a very broad Central Asia to Kazakhstan area west of the Tian Shan Mountain, explained Zhang Junfei, BTI professor and lead author of the study. In addition to pinpointing the Western apple's origins, the authors are excited to discover that the first domesticated apple had also travelled to the east hybridising with local wild apples along the way, yielding the ancestors of soft dessert apples cultivated in China today, end quote. The genetic flow has created, with human selection pressures, a relatively uniform fruit across the globe. Now, if you've tried eating cider apples and dessert apples one after the other, it becomes clear that there is much variation within the current cultivars. Yet all are malus domestica. This variation is important as it allows apples to be cultivated in a variety of climates. More on this later in the show. The contribution of the western crab apple, Malus sylvestris, is far greater than was previously thought. And it was these crosses which flowed back into Asia. The original genotype being largely unaffected by this long-term unintentional crossbreeding. True to Vavilov's hypothesis, the original apples are still a pool of untapped genetic possibilities. And now from the blog Irresistible Fleet of Bicycles comes a recommendation to read. With only 60 years of harvest left, how do we transform our food systems? Quote, Elise Wach from the Indie Farmer wrote an article published last week that explores the necessary trajectory for the future of farming. At a time when industrial agricultural systems are depleting our soil and placing quantity of produce and profit before quality and ecological health, this discussion is crucial. End quote. And from Adidas Wilson's blog comes the post, A Weed Killer is Increasingly Showing Up in People's Bodies. Another longish quote. The latest study to look at the long-term effects of Roundup, a popular weed killer developed by Monsanto in the 1970s, raises questions about the herbicide's possible contribution to poor health in certain communities. The study, published Tuesday in JAMA, tracked people over the age of 50 in Southern California from 1993 to 96, and from 2014 to 2016, with researchers periodically collecting urine samples during that time. Researchers led by Paul Mills, professor, professor of family medicine and public health at the University of California, San Diego, found that the percentage of people who tested positive for a chemical called glyphosate 
which is the active ingredient in the herbicide Roundup, shot up by 500% in that time. The levels of glyphosate also spiked by 1,208% during that time, end quote. We have from Elise Wach a description of collapsing farming methods and as industrial agriculture chews through soil and, as I've discussed elsewhere, throws huge amounts of carbon from the soil into the atmosphere as CO2. And we have growing levels of glyphosate in human bodies and by deduction throughout the biosphere. We are reaching a point where something will have to be done. The environmental costs of industrial ag are not being paid by the producers of synthetic fertilisers nor the chemical manufacturers, but by the health systems of the world, which is good for the shareholders of the former two industries, but not real good for the rest of us. Charles Massey, in an interview on Late Night Live, brought up the point that with glyphosate so ubiquitous in the environment and the rise in autism diagnoses and obesity in parallel with the increased use of glyphosate, with the Monsanto version of GN crops, he thought the controversy of smoking causing cancer would pale into insignificance as the science of the actual dangers of glyphosate comes to light. He believes this chemical affects the gut biome, and that would explain both the rise in obesity and possible connections with the autism spectrum. There is a link in the show notes to this interview, and it covers more than just the horrors of glyphosate. We are not in good shape. Let us toss in the elephant in the room. From the blog, Proactive Outside comes the blog, Bigger floods, more fires, stronger storms, longer heat waves. As the climate changes, get used to more of this. While this post highlights the climate events in the US for 2016 and 2017, which I have covered in previous episodes for the whole globe, it is worth the effort to click through to the post just for the photograph of golfers getting in around as the mountain behind them is erupting in flame. Yet Charles Massey from the Late Night Live interview mentioned above pointed out one interesting little calculation which should fill us all with hope. Roughly paraphrasing, he said, If we can increase the soil carbon on 15% of our agricultural land by 1%, we can reverse slash remove the equivalent of all the excess CO2 in the atmosphere. Now this will require a change in farming methods. It will not be a sign we can continue to burn fossil fuels forever because there are other side effects from this practice beyond climate change, pollution, lung disease and so on. Ask the citizens, or is that comrades, of Beijing. There are reasons beyond Paris COP20 for the Chinese to be pushing electric vehicles. And speaking of China, a video post from Mohammed Thalib's blog entitled China Turns Desert into Land Rich with Crops follows on from our Great Green Wall of Africa post in episode 84. If we can turn back deserts, we can turn back the Syngentas, the Monsantos and the Bayers of this world. It is time to stand while the coastlines still do, before the number of climate refugees makes a Syrian crisis look like a drop in the ocean. As overwhelming as this may seem, it can be done. Charles Massey and other farmers are doing it. Elise Wach is banging heads together. We know far more about our food species than we ever did before. We can adapt in the short term and we can reverse the effects of industrial ag without the world starving. And we can all grow a little or a lot of our own food. Take a stand. The time for hope is now. And with that, I'll finish up for this week. A transcript of this episode is available at www.worldorganicnews.com forward slash 88. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back at the same time next week.